Hi, thanks for joining us at our Water Street podcast again. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about the importance of connection and relationship in the life of our guests and those who are experiencing homelessness and how that plays such a critical role in their experience and their journey. And I'm really excited that today we have Jen Koppel with us. Jen is a good friend. She's the director of Lanco My Home, which is our local Lancaster Coalition on Homelessness. And Jen, how long have you been working with Lanco My Home? This is my 11th year. 11th year. Awesome. And could you tell us a little bit about what that is? What does it mean to have a coalition Mm -hmm. working together around the issue of homelessness? Sure. So in our 11th year, we've worked over this time to build relationships with different partners in the community, and that could be um, public, private sector, businesses, social services, government, non-government, elected officials, like the whole gamut, healthcare, the whole gamut of providers. Because what we know after all these years is that you can't really solve complex problems like homelessness without changing the conditions of the community. And that's really like that grass root, that grassroots. It's pulling people together and kind of rallying around like a big issue like homelessness. Yeah. So it's more than just the providers who are working hands on mm-hmm. with people experiencing homelessness. It's all across the spectrum. Absolutely. Yeah. And we, we realize that you can't have the level of impact with just the social service provider because we're working in such isolation at times. And, and it, if, again, if you're not changing conditions of community, right, which right. requires citizens and all of us kind of pulling together yeah. for that. So, And it's really easy to get everybody on the same page around these issues, of right? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, it, it is if you, you know, when we think about in the 11 years we've been here, it becomes more and more compelling. And COVID's done nothing but mm. just continue to exacerbate that. Absolutely. relationship yeah. need that people have all of us have so I think you know the more coordinated we get the stronger we get each year um, then we start seeing the benefits of that you know and how we tell stories it's how we talk about our 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 clients and I, I pause to use that word because it's <laughs> they're at the focus of our work right yeah. so it's yeah. you know how we journey along with the people that we're trying to serve right. and just relating to them and it right. just it becomes very clear but also you have to shift your perceptions you have to build in pauses and how you think about things and just kind of revisit your own thought processes to then absolutely yeah one of the things that I've really appreciated as Water Street's been a part of the coalition uh, since I've been around and and predating me but um, is how in your leadership you recognize that we're all working on the same issue together. We all have our own individual missions and visions <laughs> that we're trying to accomplish as organizations, as government. Um, but where can we find the commonalities? Where can we come together to move the ball forward uh, in concert together rather than just all chasing after our own our own missions? Yeah. Um, I think that's been interesting because I think at the end of the day, like you can look at an organization and see like this broad mission and, and – the purpose of my office, I have, it's myself and a team of three other people, is we're that thread puller, right? Mm-hmm. We're the ones that are building those relationships and saying, hey, I understand this is your big mission, but in the, what we're trying to do as a community, can you take this piece and like leverage it over here and yeah. then just kind of build that across? So we're not asking anybody to really change how they want to work, but just can you be a little bit more laser focused with us in this space right, and just right. like target a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, and that's so important if we're going to accomplish the goals together. Yeah. Um, to that end, one of the things that, that I know the conversation has shifted in the last couple of years around the table at Lanco, my home, where there's been a real emphasis on being person-centered. Mm-hmm. And I know that came out of kind of mm-hmm. you're leading a strategic planning process and kind of identifying how do we do this work together. I was so excited to hear that language coming into play mm-hmm. and seeing how it's been embraced. Can you explain what it means for the coalition, all these different agencies, even the government entities that are working together, to think about the issue of homelessness through a person-centered lens? I would love to talk about that because that's something that's really <laughs> at my heart. So <clears throat> when I think about like what does person-centered mean to, in my office, in our conversations, we're always asking, is it good for the client? Is it good for what that person's trying to accomplish not clients, it's client in that particular mm. sense, in that service, whatever we're trying to deliver. And I think it it shifts away from organizations attempting to address an issue without the voice of the people they're trying to serve. And, and that works to a degree, but again, you don't have that, that deeper impact. So yeah. we've made sure 
that we have client voices at every single level of the coalition, from the board into committees. Right. Um, for myself, not so much during COVID, but even still during COVID, I still do street outreach with our outreach team. I talk to the folks that were living outside. It's just I know them. I know yeah. what they're asking for. And, yeah. it's, and it's about shifting away from doing what I think you need right. to doing what you tell me you need and then looking longer term on how do we make that bigger impact. And I always think about um, a particular story where there was an elderly woman living in a, a really con- condemnable t- trailer and yeah. missing pieces of the walls, missing a fir- furnace, no real running water. And the idea was that, you know, the provider goes in and is like, oh my gosh, all of these things have to be fixed. I'm going to get you a furnace. I'm going to get you. We've got the resources. Right. We can help. We're gonna we can do, do all this. this stuff. And she didn't want any of that. And it really took the provider back and was like, well, I'm looking at all of these things. What do you want? And she's, she said, I want a friend. <laughs> and, you know, if we don't pause wow. and, you know, just say, okay, well, I, I have to suspend what I think you need. All right, yeah. let's yeah. sit and talk to you. And let's, let's have that relationship, yeah. right? And that's what it, over and over and over, when we talk to the folks that are outside, they want to be seen, they want to be heard. That's the client centeredness right yeah. so when we look at all of the things that we've created in the last two plus years that we've been in this new strategic plan it's all been them mm-hmm. we're just we're executing what they've asked us to do yeah that's excellent that's so important i know even at water street you know we recently have added a board member who has has walked the journey of homelessness and actually was a client here at water street years ago and the insights that that he can bring to the table are so different than the board and even when you get to the provider level mm-hmm. um it, we're so blessed to have life coaches who have experienced this in case management like across our our staffing there are people who have experienced poverty have experienced homelessness and can can view things through a different lens, but then the importance of the individual, the yeah. person who's in front of you. And I think that's so so kind of the next piece of, of where I'd like to go with this conversation is the role of relationships. You speak mm-hmm. about, you know, the the woman who mm-hmm. what she wanted most was a relationship. She she didn't want the walls fixed. I mean, maybe eventually. Right. But right now what she was feeling the most was relationships. And um I think one of the things that I've observed and I'd love to hear from you on is the role that relationships play or the lack of relationships in leading to homelessness. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the follow up to that is how it helps in leading out of homelessness. Um, But but how do you see that dynamic of of the role of relationships? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say for every single person, regardless of whether you're in um, at risk of becoming homelessness or not, relationships are what people crave and need that social emotional support the loving the belongingness the sense of community and i over time when if you think about what leads folks into homelessness it's lots of trauma where relationships are toxic broken harmful Mm. at young ages you know for long periods of time that we know that trauma actually changes the oh, yeah, the physiology the physio- of the brain. that's it yeah. thank you the physiology of the brain and if you can't get treatment for that that that's how you just respond over and over right. and over for right. the rest of your life you potentially yeah. you know and that's why we're focused on trauma-informed care right and when so. you're constantly responding out of a space of trauma fight or flight you're not going to be able to maintain relationships very well absolutely not <laughs> i mean it, it, your brain's not designed to do that right. so it's designed for self-preservation so you have that and then you have those fight and flight responses and then you have you know childhood trauma and adverse childhood experiences leads to substance use and mental health and the more complex it becomes mm-hmm. the harder it is to just keep productive and healthy relationships so it's just constant like one breaking after another and then you like how can you not expect to be at some bottom point right Right, because if you don't have the relationships to help you get away from that there's not really much then to stop you from getting there either at some point right absolutely I think that's you know we're gonna we're gonna go deeper into that uh, area of mental health issues and, and trauma in one of our later podcasts but the thing you touched on there about how those things can lead to the breakdown of relationships. And I think that's one of the things, and and we were joking earlier, 
you know, there's, there's a common phrase, you know, all of us, you know, we could, we could be only one or two steps away uh, from being on the street. And I'll be honest with you, I've been here for a lot of years at Water Street. I don't agree with that. <clears throat> and I think um, the circumstances that can lead to homelessness can happen to any of us. I know that if I was to lose my job traumatically or have a major medical emergency, I probably wouldn't end up in, on the street right away. Right. It's going to take a lot of steps to get there because I have relationships. Mm, I've been right. blessed. I have a connection community around me where there are relationships. And thankfully, at this point, I haven't destroyed too many bridges, right? And so right. I'd have family members that I could go and stay at their house who could help me out for a while, help me pay the rent, mm. help me pay my mortgage for, for a season. Eventually, over time, if those things continue to build on each other or – if I was in more of a, a, an unhealthy mental state uh, dealing with other issues where I might start breaking down those relationships. And it's that, it's the combination of the traumatic life event, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the tragedy that happens and the lack of relational support. And that's what I think we see with a lot of our friends who are on the street right now. Yeah. It's not one or the other, it's both. Absolutely. And I'm wondering, you know, especially as you talk with our outreach workers who are out there all the time, is, does that ring true with what they're seeing? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, you mentioned earlier about like, how, what does the role, what's the role of relationship on the other side? Like, you know, we have folks on the street now and how does the relationship play on the other side? But that's mm -hmm. where that becomes that person centered, right? So if we think about all of the things that break to get a person to having no other choice but to sleep on the street. I mean, that's profound. Yeah. Building back from that is not a five-minute process. Right, so right. it's not like I can come in and say to you, I'm from, you know, this provider organization, I'm going to get you what you need. <laughs> it just, in, in this space, it, it just yeah. doesn't work because people have heard that a hundred times. Right. Right. And they've asked along the way to, before they get to this space, and it didn't happen. You know, so there's lots of trust and issues that you have to build back. And you, if you can't, as the as the person working with the individual experiencing homelessness, if you can't commit to changing yourself too, right, and mm. being in that relationship, it doesn't work as well as it could, right? So it doesn't mean that everybody's friends with everybody, but it does mean that if you're seeing the value of that person across from you and, and we have amazing providers and, and organizations and teams yeah. that do that, yeah. then you have the ability to say, okay, well, my relationship with you is going to change me and I'm okay with that because I'm going to learn some really cool things about you and things that I would have never known. And you're going to tell me these stories that are going to make <laughs> me believe that you are like the most resilient and strong person because yeah. you are, because yeah. you're living in a situation that few of us would navigate well. So we have to be able to, do that. And then, yeah. you know, the complexity of specifically substance use and addiction and mental health on top of it, then you're also speaking through that illness. Right. And that's incredibly difficult because right. right. that's what, that's what the person's dealing and responding yeah. to. So. And there's no easy prescription provided from no. the outside. It's got to be done in relationship Absolutely. when you're dealing with that level and complexity of issues yeah. in somebody's life. That's, that's so good. And I, I'm, I'm so grateful for Lanco, my home, for the relationships we have, the fact that there are outreach workers from multiple agencies out there that are communicating, not only walking alongside the, the individuals on the street, but communicating back with mm -hmm places like us and places like the other community emergency shelter to say, hey, here's somebody who they might be ready to come in. Right. <laughs> um, we're getting there. And and so you need to be prepared. And so we know what we're expecting when somebody walks through the door. We can be sensitive to, to what their circumstances are and then get to know them on their level, um, which is such a critical kind of path forward. Um, I think one of the places where there could be tension between a place like Water Street and like my home is around, you know, what's the overriding philosophy driving our services and, and funding that comes behind a housing first philosophy and, and holding up housing first as this is the answer versus Water Street saying we want to walk a journey and have long term residential transitional opportunities for people. What I love about uh, our community and about you, Jen, and, and, and how we work is when you take housing first and you put it through a person-centered lens, it's a little different. It is. Um, and because it's not just about getting the resources 
and matching up a person with a resource, but it's listening to the individual. Um, and I think that's so, so critical. So how do you um, help uh, our community take that kind of housing first? Because there's a, that's where the government wants us to use our money. Um, and, and there's, you know, funding available for that through that person centered lens. And how does that make a difference? When you look back prior to the housing first, even being a thing, right? right? We had services that regardless of your specific circumstances, every single person went through this thing Mm -hmm. and it could be a budgeting class or a parenting class or, or fire, like whatever it was. Right. And the, all people don't need the one thing, right? So it, it's about giving people hope that on the other side of this crisis that you're in, you have value, you have worth, you will be okay, we will help you get to that. So that, to me, is sort of that idea that housing first is, like, we don't want you to be in a shelter for two years. Like, right, because, right. you know, but if you, that's what you need in this moment, Okay, yeah. so it's it's I th- I think it's taking the idea of everybody has the human right to a home, mm-hmm. and then applying it individually, yeah. right? So if we shift the perspective to that, okay, everybody has the right to a home. Um, we're gonna that's our end goal, right? There could be five steps to that for you, or mm. there could be a thousand steps yeah. to that for you. But it's about you and it's what you need. You. Yeah. So it's really just thinking about not everybody gets the same thing because you're in the program. It's how do you make the program individualized with that end goal that everybody has that right to that house. Mm. That's so good. Yeah. And, and that only comes about through relationship, through taking the time to get to know and understand the individual. Uh, These aren't just nameless, faceless clients. It's, these are individuals. They're our neighbors, Mm -hmm. they're friends, family members um, who have gone through incredible trauma and tragedy in their lives to land at this place. And so how do we come alongside, get Mm -hmm. to know them? Um, and that's, uh, you know, I, I love seeing Lanco, my home and, and the, all the agencies that are a part of it, kind of looking at it through that lens. That's what we're trying to do here at water street. Um, in a few minutes, we're going to be talking with one of our staff specifically about that relationship building process as people come on board, um, as they come through our door and in those first several weeks of, of what it takes to just take the time to get to know them before we come up with a prescription for mm-hmm. this is what's going to solve your, yeah. your life crisis. Um, let's get to know each other first. Yeah. So Our, These folks are great people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. Uh, the stories that, mm-hmm. that you have that we have here at Water Street. And uh, Jen, I'm so grateful for you taking the time to talk with us today uh, to share insights. Even more, I'm grateful for the work that you're doing with Lanco My Home. Yeah, we are, I'm equally grateful, Jack. I mean, I think back all these years, like we're good friends. Like I would yeah. be lost without you, right? <laughs> and just to be able to, to think about the relationship with Water Street, you guys are awesome. So I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I want to give a profound thanks to our season one podcast sponsor, Rogers and Associates, who's helping us tremendously in this first year of the Restores podcast. They're a wealth management firm that helps clients become financially independent for retirement. You can learn more about them online at rogers-associates.com or by calling 717-560-3800. That's Rogers, R-O-D-G-E-R-S-associates.com or by calling 717-560-3800. Thank you so much, Rogers and Associates. Welcome back. We're excited to continue our conversation about the role of connection and relationship in the lives of our guests and others experiencing homelessness. And the second part of our conversation today, uh, we're excited to have Dan Mesher with us here on our Restores podcast. Dan Mesher is our life coach supervisor who supervises um, our emergency shelter and day shelter team, uh, specifically the day shelter. And Dan, how long have you been with Water Street? Uh, I'm coming up on five years here. Five years. Fantastic. We'll get to celebrate an anniversary coming soon. All right. Excellent. Um, Tell us a little bit about, for, for our viewers out there, a little bit about what the day shelter is and why having a day shelter at Water Street is such an important part of what we do. Yeah, so uh, day shelter is a um, place for us to, as staff members, really connect with guests. Um, a lot of times I'll tell uh, new staff especially, but even our old staff as I'm uh, recasting vision, but a lot of what we do is with. We use that word with a lot. 
So we want to walk alongside people as they're experiencing homelessness and as they're trying to set goals to get out of homelessness, um, whatever those goals may be. So we want to empower people to um, to do those things and when, when appropriate, provide accountability and these kind of things. But the day shelter is neat because there's an opportunity to connect with uh, resources um, outside of staff. Uh, now we're going to build relationships with people, uh, but we also have community partners coming in to um, make connections with them, as whether it's mental health or we have uh, veterans coming in to provide uh, things for them and um, some different uh, opportunities that that guests have to um, to get right at the at the shelter, so they don't have to walk yeah. uptown yeah. wherever that might be. Um, but the shelter also uh, provides uh, another purpose. Um, uh, I mean, it's kind of like a landing spot for people during the day. Yeah. They can they can be in and they can take advantage of some things. They don't have to be. A lot of people are out working, right. looking for work, looking for housing. Um, but uh, but it's also a place of safety. Mm. Uh, I've heard that come up uh, a number of times. I had a guy who was a uh, a sex addict and he was trying to beat this, and um, he said he was accosted by a, a female prostitute uh, mm-hmm. a few blocks from here wow and he had the this uh, vision of uh, Joseph in Genesis running right for you know for his purity <laughs> and for away. his life um, <laughs> and so he started to run and he ran back here mm. and he realized when he got back he said I made it mm. and uh, so for him um, Water Street is you know our day shelter is a like a haven of safety for some people depending on what they're going wow. through and uh, you hear that with uh, people struggling with addiction as well yeah, and, and there's a significant difference. There's a lot of missions across the country and shelters across the country. A lot of them, and, and maybe some of our, our viewers or listeners may be familiar, they just do overnight emergency shelter. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things that I love about Water Street is that a number of years ago we added the day shelter. Um, in a typical emergency shelter, you spend the night and you got to be out first thing in the morning, and then you got to check back in at dinner time or at 7 o'clock at night. But during the day, you're on your own. And um, having a place, that idea of safety is so critical. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, we want people out, you know, exploring opportunities and jobs and, and connecting with providers if necessary, but to bring them on site, but to have a safe place for them. Um, that idea of safety is, it, it feels so important to me. Uh, I'm assuming more than just that one individual, as you said. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And especially people that are struggling in addiction, you know, you can pretty much buy anything that you want mm. in these streets mm-hmm. uh, right outside of, uh, of our campus. So uh, for those struggling with addiction, um, a lot of times they'll just stay put and, uh, and um, you know, try to get some services here um, because it's very tempting out there. Um, and so, yeah, uh, that's uh, one of the great things, not the only thing, but it's one of the great things, one of the things that stands out as you ask me uh, – to talk about the day shelter a little bit, that it really is a place of safety for a refuge for people. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, you mentioned the service providers coming in that we can make connections with. I know even recently we've added our nurse case manager has right. been coming over. Um, it's it's only down the block on the same <laughs> yeah. campus that they could go to, to the uh, clinic, but that can be hard sometimes. And so bringing it right to them, uh, there's a relational aspect to that. That's that's so critical of meeting them where they're at, and uh, and I know that's the heartbeat of day shelter and your heartbeat, Dan, for our guests is to meet them where they're at. Um, maybe you could speak to that uh, that issue of relationship and taking the time to get to know somebody um, and their individual story. Yeah, well, I think it starts with um, uh, it, sometimes I hear people. Um, like outside of here, talk to me about, you know, they know what I do. How do you work with those people? You know, what's mm-hmm. it like working with those people? Um, and I, I think that when we see our guests as those people, it's almost like it's a different class. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's intentional, but it's it just sort of, you know, somehow they're lower than us or they're different than us or we're better than them. Right. And if we see it like that, we cannot minister effectively to them. Um, so one of the things I say is um, – you know, I'm not going to see them as those people or I don't work with them, that group. I am them. Mm. Um, if I cannot see myself in my guests, in our guests, um, then I'm not going to have any kind of impact mm. uh, on them. And so, um, you know, we all have a different story. Everybody's got a different story. Some of us on staff have experienced homelessness. Some have been at the mission. Right. Um, some have been through addiction. Uh, some have mental health and physical health issues. Um, some... You know, 
weren't raised with a full set of life skills. So struggle relationally and all these kind of things. Um, and so everybody has a story and my story is a little different than, but I got to be able to see myself and our guests just as a, as a baseline, uh, to really be able to connect and minister with them. Yeah. It, it all starts with that level playing field. People talk about being level ground at the foot of the cross, but, uh, sometimes even before you can introduce somebody to Jesus and that concept, it's level ground in the day shelter, it's yeah. level ground in the dining hall. <laughs> it really <laughs> is. Just start yeah. at the most basic place. It is. And, and we don't see people as, uh, homeless or people, we understand they're experiencing homelessness, but yeah. we don't see them as homeless or poor people. We see them like ourselves. Yeah. It could be my neighbor. It could be my father. Yeah. Uh, so we want to treat people, everybody that comes in the door, no matter what's going on, like the way we want to be treated. Yeah. And I think that gets communicated um, uh, to our guests as well. I think they, they pick that up. Mm-hmm. I appreciate you saying that, Dan. I think that language is such a powerful thing. Mm-hmm. And when we call somebody the homeless or a homeless person, we're putting a label on them or identifying them. And, and I know the language we try to use, uh, here at water street and, and others I think are adopting is, you know, it's our, it's our neighbors who are experiencing homelessness. They're going through an event, a time in their life an experience that's really hard, but the experience doesn't define who they are. It's their circumstances. It's not who they are. And, um, and hearing you just reflectively reflectively use that language um i think speaks to the heart of of the work that you're doing yeah so i mean there's a there's a number of ways that we try to do that as far as like really um making it practical Mm -hmm. um but one of one of the other big things is a lot of things we do but one of the big things is i really want people to know that they're seen Mm -hmm. um people on the street either they're kind of gawked at it's like a spectacle yeah um or ignored (laughs) <laughs> or ignored, they're invisible, <laughs> Yeah, you know? And so when the guy comes to me asking for money in my car, I don't even look at him. Hmm. And so uh, people could become invisible. And um, and after a while, if enough people uh, don't see you, they start to wonder, man, does God see me? Hmm. And so people have lost lost that completely. So I want everybody to come in the door and, and know that they're seen. So we're going to go out of our way. Um, we're going to be creative about how we are interacting mm-hmm. Um uh, with guests, even th- difficult guests, yeah, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, we're going to do what we can, take steps um, towards them, even though they're going to struggle with trust yeah. and some of these things. Um, but we're going to do what we can. We want everybody to know that they're seen. And if they believe that we see them, then I think, you know, that's one step towards, you know, God sees you too. You right. know, he hasn't forgotten right, you. Right, right. And sometimes that takes the form of uh, more kind of just fun wacky things like trivia contests and bingo games and watching movies together or even playing chess. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, uh, I have a staff member. I, I laugh cause, uh, I have one of my staff members, uh, has been with us for a couple years. And, um, you know, a lot of times when I come in the shelter, there he is playing chess, right? Especially early on, <laughs> he would say, Yo, Dan, you know, um, is it okay if I'm playing chess? I, you know, you know, it's not the only thing I'm doing. <laughs> And I, I had to sit him down and say, listen, if you play chess eight hours a day with our guests, that is a good use of eight hours hmm. because you're making connections with people um, that maybe I'm not making connections with. Right. And we all have different strengths. Um, and so we're going to use them. God can use all those. And so, yeah, we're going to we're going to take the time to be with people in our shelter, whatever it is. They want to play chess, but a lot of things come up in that. And we play trivia. <laughs> um, but we're going to continue to try to make connections. Yeah as often as we can. Uh, one of the things I um, also talk about is uh, uh, what I call human touch points. Mm-hmm. So we, we talk about spiritual touch points, um, but human touch points really believe that the more meaningful interactions we have with guests, the more likely they are to succeed, mm-hmm. to set goals and to, and to meet those goals. And so we're going to do all kinds of, we'll do all kinds of things. We'll play bingo. Right. Um, we'll give prizes right. and so we're going to have fun. We we'll have music on. We'll do, um, uh, yeah, different board games. We'll do, you know, different types of things. Cornhole. I was gonna say I got beat at cornhole a couple times got beat last at year out in yeah. the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, cornhole is interesting. I can do pretty much every other sport with the ball, but when it comes to getting that in it's a little hole, bag, I just can't yeah. do it. So, um, so yeah, and then and then we're gonna have some serious conversations too. Yeah. Um, when things come up, and you know, we see. Um, uh, 
crises, and we have a number of those really as opportunities, you know, to really speak in and to listen well and to make an impact. And I love some of that recreational stuff too, then helps the connection be more than just, uh, I'm here to help you. It's hey, like we're bonding over something we both enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And so there becomes a different level of connection. Again, it's that leveling. It's not an us, them thing. It's, hey, we're all here together. Mm -hmm. You enjoy this, I enjoy it. Let's let's spend some time together. Yeah. And, uh, and that builds that foundation. Mm. And, um, you know, we were talking earlier with, with Jen Koppel from the Lanco My Home and about how the breakdown of relationships is often such a contributing factor to how people become homeless in the first place. Um, can you speak a little bit to how the rebuilding and even relearning how to have relationship, as you've seen that with our guests, becomes a stepping stone forward out of homelessness? Yeah, we had a guy uh, this week come in brand new. Um, he came in Monday or Tuesday. And uh, he was saying, yeah, I've been homeless uh, other places, different times, and other, other uh, shelters. And, um, but he said, Water Street's different. Um, so I said, you know, tell me more about that. And he said when he came in, he recognized right away that the staff cared. Mm. And uh, he said he's been other places where people are just there for a paycheck. It was so obvious. Wow. Nobody cared whether anybody got out of homelessness. Wow. That was his experience. So it's not just the day shelter that's so critical. It's really the people, the very first interactions that mm. that our guests have with our staff, they really set the tone for, uh, you know, kind of our whole ministry yeah. and really what we want to be about. Um, and so when I heard that guy saying that and in tears, um, that makes an impact. Mm. Um, uh, you know, to know that people uh, care for you, um, people you just met, they care for you, you can tell. Um, the way that we that we treat people, we're treating them with dignity, with honor, respect. Some of these things, all these things that we that we want. Yeah. Um, and so it goes a really long way. And, and I think um, you know, part of the thing that uh, that we do, a responsibility that we hold as staff members with our guests, really is, it's a great responsibility, but to really hold out hope for guests. Mm -hmm. You know, as we're building a relationship with them, um, many people have. Uh, Lost hope decades ago, right? Yeah, yeah. I used to work with Absolutely. juvenile offenders, and recidivism rate is very high. And you know, all the kids know the st statistics. And but when you ask them around the room in detention, you know, who's going to be in prison as an adult? Mm -hmm. Nobody raises their hand. Right. They all have hope for themselves. You know, it's not going to be me. And I don't know if that's the optimism of youth or what that is. <laughs> um, but many of our guests, when they come in, they have no hope. There's nothing left. And so we get to uh, hold out that hope mm. for them. And I think that's really powerful. Um, you know, we can hold out that hope for them because as believers yeah. in, in God and Christ, we understand God is a business, business of transforming lives. Yeah. That's what he does. So there's always hope for everybody. I don't care how many times they've been in or how long they've been in addiction for decades. Yeah. Um, and so um, all this is so critical to somebody uh, – you know, on the flip side, if we just didn't care, yeah, man, they have no hope. Nobody, you right, know, no right, one's right, invested. Right. No one's making an impact. What does it matter? Um, but to be able to to be able to live this out to them, yeah. um, and then you know to point them back to God oh, as well. And there's a dynamic in that I've I've never really thought of, of before until you just said that. Like how, you know, you could have hope for a stranger, but that your hope for them doesn't have any impact on their lives. Like. Some stranger stands up and says, you know, there's hope for your life. You can do that. Like, what does that mean to me? You don't even have a clue what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. But when you're walking in relationship with somebody, when you've taken the time to get to know their story and you can carry hope for them, suddenly they start to feel it. Mm -hmm. But it, it's the combination of the two. It's not just some anonymous, nameless person who runs into them once and says, I have hope for you. It's somebody who's walking closely with them who can maintain that hope and create a picture of hope for them when it's done in relationship. There's right. power to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm grateful, Dan, for you and for your team that you guys are doing that every day uh, with the men and women who are coming through our shelter, who are hanging out in the day shelter, that they have the chance to walk alongside you and, and for you to carry hope with them and uh, help them embrace that, uh, the hope of Christ, the hope for a future the hope to, to emerge out of homelessness. So thank you for the work that you're doing at Water Street and for leading your team. 
So, well, thanks for sharing with us today. Yeah, um, some great stuff around the power of relationship. That's what it's all about. And um, I hope you guys enjoyed our conversation today. And we'll see you next time.